Welcome to the Awareness Online Learning Module, Understanding Violence in the Workplace Regulations of Nova Scotia. Today we will be discussing the rules and regulations as outlined in the Violence in the Workplace Regulations of Nova Scotia. Today's agenda will include such topics as various workplace violence legislation concepts, the different ways people may define what workplace violence is, a look at what the workplace violence regulations are and what they have to say, what the regulations say about assessing workplace violence, and what employers are required to do when planning for workplace violence. Workplace violence has become a significant occupational health and safety issue within the health and community services sector of Nova Scotia. Every day, health and community service workers encounter a variety of challenging situations that expose them to risks of workplace violence. Exposure to workplace violence can leave long-lasting physiological and physical effects to both the individual and the entire workplace environment. Even though workplace violence can be found across all sectors of the workforce, Statistics show that health and community services workers account for some of the highest rates of workplace violence in Nova Scotia. As you can see from the chart above, health and community service workers hold the top three most violent places to work in Nova Scotia. For this reason, health and community services employers need to have a clear understanding of workplace violence issues and regulations so as to be able to effectively keep its workers safe from incidents of workplace violence. Let's take a few moments and discuss what the Nova Scotia legislation has to say about workplace violence. Nova Scotia's Violence in the Workplace Regulations came into effect on June 9, 2007, which prescribes specific requirements for employers who may have the potential for workplace violence. It requires employers to conduct a violence risk assessment and establish and implement a workplace violence prevention plan where a significant risk of violence is identified. Workplaces where the primary business is health services, including those services provided at a healthcare workplace, were required to implement the provisions as stipulated in the Violence in the Workplace Regulations by April 1, 2008. The Criminal Code of Canada also establishes a duty for all persons directing the work of others to take reasonable steps to ensure the safety of workers and the public. Therefore, incidents involving violence or threats of violence that occur in the workplace, such as assault, sexual assault, criminal harassment, stalking, robbery, and uttering threats, may also be prosecuted under the Criminal Code of Canada. However, workplace violence is becoming a much larger problem throughout all Canadian workplaces, and for this reason, many provincial jurisdictions are broadening their definition of workplace violence to include other types of behavior that may be perceived as workplace violence. These include verbal abuse, bullying, harassment, and domestic violence. The Violence in the Workplace Regulations define violence as Threats, including a threatening statement or threatening behavior that gives an employee reasonable cause to believe that the employee is at risk of physical injury. Conduct or attempted conduct of a person that endangers the physical health or physical safety of an employee. As we can see from this definition, the regulations only defines workplace violence as it pertains to the physical aspect of violence. Even though workplace bullying and domestic violence are not specifically addressed under the Nova Scotia regulations, your employer needs to consider both of these behaviors as significant risk factors when evaluating workplace violence. For this reason, your organization may wish to explore non-legislative descriptions of workplace violence that go beyond the definition set out in the regulations and should consider adding workplace bullying and domestic violence as part of your workplace violence program. Even though there are many types of violence that workers may encounter in the health and community services sectors, most workplace violence incidents fall into one of four categories. 
The first type, or type 1, is external violence. Here we have a person who has no connection or relationship to the organization and is seen as an external threat. The second, or type 2, is internal violence. Here we have a person who could be a resident, customer, or visitor who becomes violent towards a worker or another resident, client, or patient. Next we have the third, or type 3, which is worker-on-worker -worker violence. Here we have a situation where an employee of an organization who becomes violent towards another worker at that workplace. And finally, type 4, or domestic violence, which is where the person usually has some form of personal or domestic relationship with an employee, client, patient, or resident, and comes to the workplace with the intent of doing harm. Regardless of what category of violence the person falls into, workers may experience a variety of different forms of violence, including hitting, grabbing, biting, pinching, pushing, physical assault, sexual assault, stalking, robbery, or threats of violence. In addition to the physical injuries, workers may also experience a number of psychological or emotional effects caused from workplace violence incidents. These effects may include anxiety, depression, weight gain or loss, family or marital issues, and even suicide attempts. Where physical injuries may be easier to identify and may heal quickly, emotional or psychological effects may be much harder to see and could last for extended periods of time. Left untreated, these effects may cause long-term mental and or physical disabilities. To be effective in developing strategies that ensure workers are protected from these effects of workplace violence, employers need to have a good understanding of the contributing factors that lead to violence at your organization. Many health and community service workers perceive the violence they encounter as merely part of the job and are not informed that these forms of workplace violence are issues that should be reported and investigated. As we mentioned before, health and community service workers experience unique physical and operational challenges in their daily work routines that increase their risk of exposure to workplace violence. These may include working with people who have mental health issues, lifting, moving, and transporting clients or residents, working in remote locations, staff shortages, poor environmental design, lack of means of emergency communication, working in neighborhoods with high crime rates, lack of training and policies for staff, understaffing, inadequate security staff, and perception that violence is tolerated and reporting incidents will have no effect. To combat these physical, operational, and cultural issues, employers need to develop and manage an effective workplace violence program in order to keep their employees safe from the harm of workplace violence. In order to do this, employers and employees need to have a clear understanding of the legislation and regulations that regulate workplace violence. Violence in the Workplace Regulations of Nova Scotia As stated before, in Nova Scotia, violence in the workplace is legislated under Section 82 of the Nova Scotia Occupational Health and Safety Act through the Violence in the Workplace Regulations. This means the Violence in the Workplace Regulations fall under the same legislation that governs occupational health and safety. This is important as it means your employer is required to address workplace safety as a safety hazard and therefore must incorporate their workplace violence prevention programs as part of their occupational health and safety program. Let's start to take a look at how the violence in the workplace regulations assist your employer in dealing with violence in the workplace. According to the Department of Labor and Advanced Education, the purpose of the regulations are to reinforce the duty employers have under the Occupational Health and Safety Act to take reasonable precautions to ensure the health and safety of persons at or near a workplace. They also state it outlines the process to be followed in addressing workplace violence in industry sectors where the problem is most acute. In essence, the regulations provide an outline of the rules and procedures 
that an employer must follow when they are developing and implementing the workplace violence program. In order for your employer to adequately place controls that will keep you safe from incidents of workplace violence, your employer will need to first identify and assess the various risks of violence found in your workplace. Let's take a look at what the regulations say your employer needs to do when it comes to assessing the risk of violence at your workplace. Risk Assessment A workplace violence risk assessment is a systematic process that identifies and assesses the risk of violence in your workplace with the goal of developing and implementing adequate controls to protect workers from the hazards of workplace violence. It does this through the identification of workplace hazards that pose threats of violence to any individual that is at or near that workplace. The regulations state that an employer must conduct a violence risk assessment for each of their workplaces to determine if there is a risk of violence in the workplace and prepare a written report concerning the violence risk assessment detailing the extent and nature of any risk identified by the assessment. For example, if a long-term care organization has multiple facilities, each facility would need to conduct a risk assessment to determine its own risks of violence. They must also prepare a written report detailing the extent and nature of any identified risks of violence from each facility it assessed. Regardless of what type of organization you work for, the regulations require that all employers must consider the following factors when conducting the risk assessment. Violence that has occurred in the workplace in the past. Violence that is known to occur in similar workplaces. The circumstances in which work takes place. The interactions that occur in the course of performing work. The physical location and layout of the workplace. When it comes to the healthcare and community service sectors, there are a number of unique considerations that your employer may need looked at. Some of these include outside locations, medication storage and distribution, safe handling and mobility of individuals, transportation of people and items, systems to call for assistance, working in remote locations, cash handling procedures, working alone, and or working at night. Even though your employer is responsible for ensuring a risk assessment is completed, your employer must consult and provide a copy of the risk assessment report to any committee or safety representative at the workplace for their review. In addition to identifying new hazards, there are instances when your employer may need to conduct a new risk assessment. The regulations specify that your employer must conduct a new risk assessment if the employer becomes aware of a type of violence occurring in similar workplaces that was not taken into consideration when the previous violence risk assessment was conducted, or if five years pass since the last risk assessment was done. In addition, an employer must also conduct a new violence risk assessment when there is a change in any of the following the circumstances in which work takes place, the interactions that occur in the course of performing work, the physical location or layout of the workplace, the employer plans to construct a new facility or renovate an existing facility, or the employer is ordered to do so by an officer. Conducting a violence risk assessment can seem like a daunting task to complete. To aid health and community service organizations with their risk assessment process, Awareness has developed a number of resources that can aid organizations with conducting a workplace violence risk assessment. These resources include the Workplace Violence Hazard Risk Assessment Template and Program Guide, which provides a step-by-step -step process that organizations can use to assist them when planning and conducting their workplace violence risk assessment. These can be found on the Awareness website on the Workplace Violence Prevention page under the Programs tab. And also the online learning course Workplace Violence Risk Assessment Tool, which further explains the risk assessment process. And then also Planning for Workplace Violence, 
which is a half-day classroom course. Workplace Violence Prevention Plan At this point, we have had an opportunity to see some of the regulations your employer needs to consider when looking at workplace violence. We particularly looked at what your employer needs to do in order to identify and assess hazards of workplace violence. But identifying and assessing hazards is not enough. Your employer will need to come up with some sort of plan to make your workplace safe from violence. This plan is called the Workplace Violence Prevention Plan. Before we do this, let's take a quick look at what a violence prevention plan is and why it is so important. A workplace violence prevention plan outlines the strategies your employer will use to reduce or eliminate workplace violence to its workers. It sets the stage on how an organization will fulfill its obligations as it relates to the act. The plan is developed by using the findings of your employer's risk assessment to develop policies, procedures, or best practices that will outline the measures on how to prevent and respond to acts of workplace violence. Now let's take a look at what the regulations say about what your employer needs to know in order to create a workplace violence prevention plan. The first thing that the regulations say about a prevention plan is that an employer must establish and implement a workplace violence prevention plan for each workplace for which a significant risk of violence is identified through a violence risk assessment or that an officer orders a plan for. Earlier we used an example that said if a long-term care organization had multiple facilities it would need to conduct a risk assessment for each facility. If we keep to this example, each facility would need to create its own individual workplace prevention plan to address its own workplace violence prevention risks. This is important as it will guarantee that each facility would have its own policies and procedures to address their particular workplace violence hazards. Just as your employer is required to follow specific rules for conducting a new risk assessment, the regulations outline when a new prevention plan needs to be reviewed and revised. This includes, if a new violence risk assessment indicates a significant change to the extent and nature of the risk of violence, the employer must ensure that the plan is reviewed and if necessary, revised and or at least every five years, a workplace violence prevention plan must be reviewed and if necessary, revised. When we look at developing a workplace violence prevention plan, the regulations specify a number of elements that need to be included in the plan. These include a written workplace violence prevention statement, Documentation of reasonable measures to minimize and to the extent possible eliminate the risk of violence in the workplace. Establish and document procedures for 1. Providing employees with information 2. Training and 3. Reporting, documenting, and investigating incidents of violence. It should be noted that the regulations reflect the minimum requirements to develop a workplace prevention plan. Because of the unique risk factors associated in the health and community services sector, your employer may need to go beyond the minimum requirements in order to fulfill their responsibility for ensuring the safety of everyone at the workplace. Now let's take some time and discuss these various elements. The Workplace Violence Prevention Statement or Policy the regulations state that an employer must prepare and develop a workplace violence prevention statement, which must also include all of the following minimum requirements. Recognize that violence is an occupational health and safety hazard in the workplace. Recognize the physical and emotional harm resulting from violence. Recognize that any form of violence is unacceptable. State the organization's commitment to minimize or, where possible, eliminate the risk of violence, and outline consequences of behaviors. After your employer creates a workplace violence prevention statement, an employer must post a copy in a prominent place or places in each of their workplaces, 
so it can be easily accessed by employees and must ensure that it remains posted. In addition to posting the prevention statement and policy, it is also required that all employees receive training on your organization's statement or policy. This can be done through employee orientations, safety huddles, safety campaigns, and any other safety activities an employer wishes to conduct. As we have already seen, the purpose of the Workplace Violence Prevention Plan is to outline the way your employer will ensure all individuals are safe from workplace violence. Simply developing the plan is not enough. In order for the plan to be effective, your employer needs to communicate the contents of the plan to all the individuals in the workplace. According to the regulations, an employer must provide an employee who is exposed to a significant risk of violence in a workplace with information on the nature and extent of the risk and on any factors that may increase or decrease the extent of the risk, and has a duty to provide information related to a risk of violence from a person who has a history of violent behavior if that person is likely to be encountered by the employee. Both these requirements are even more significant when we look at the work environment of the health and community service sector. Since healthcare and community services workers provide services to people who may be experiencing higher than normal levels of anxiety and or stress, it is imperative that workers are given all the necessary information about the risks of workplace violence they may encounter. This increased levels of stress or anxiety may be caused by lack of information, fear of the unknown, bad news concerning themselves or a loved one, lack of control over a situation, previous bad experiences with health care, and mental or physical injury or illness they may be suffering from. Training. In addition to providing information to workers, employers must also provide adequate training and supervision to all employees who are exposed or have potential to be exposed to significant risks of violence. The regulations specify the following six topics that workers must be trained on. The rights and responsibilities of employees under the Act, the Workplace Violence Prevention Statement, the measures taken by the employer to minimize or eliminate the risk of violence, how to recognize a situation in which there is a potential for violence and how to respond appropriately, how to respond to an incident of violence, including how to obtain assistance, and how to report, document, and investigate incidents of violence. The regulations also goes on to specify that an employer must provide any employee who is required by the employer to perform a function under the Workplace Violence Prevention Plan with training on the plan generally and on the particular function to be performed by the employee. For example, if a caseworker for a community service department was tasked to assist with performing a new risk assessment for their organization, the employer would need to provide training for both the Workplace Violence Prevention Plan itself and training on how to carry out the risk assessment. Healthcare and community service organizations are made up of a variety of different positions encompassing a variety of duties and functions. Many need to consider that various positions at their organizations may require additional or specific workplace violence training in addition to what is specified in the regulations. Managers and or supervisors should review the employee's position and determine the appropriate level of training required based on the workplace violence risk assessment. Workplace violence training is essential in order to help employees eliminate or reduce the risks of encountering workplace violence. Through adequate and effective training, employers will help ensure that employees have the necessary skills to prevent, react, and report workplace violence incidents if they occur. Reporting. Just like any hazard found within your workplace, Reporting of workplace violence is critical in keeping individuals safe at the workplace. 
The regulations also address the requirement for reporting of workplace violence incidents. It states that an employer, contractor, constructor, supplier, employee, owner, or self-employed person in the workplace has the duty to report all incidents of violence in a workplace to the employer. One point that should be noted here is that the regulations do not limit the reporting of workplace violence to just the employees of an organization. It requires that any individual at the workplace is required to report workplace violence. This is important as employers need to ensure that any outside individual performing work on their workplace needs to be aware of and trained on any of the workplace violence procedures. As we saw earlier, many of these workers value the life of their patient, clients, or residents above their own and therefore are hesitant to report incidents of violence to their supervisor, committee, or even other co-workers as they perceive the violence they encounter as merely part of the job. In addition, many workers also fail to report incidents because they perceive these acts of violence as unintentional and therefore unavoidable due to some form of diminished capacity or mental illness that the individual suffers from. Many workers also fear that if they do report these instances of violence, it will create a stigmatism towards the individual based on their sickness or illness. Employers need to ensure that workers know that all workplace violence incidents need to be reported to the appropriate supervisor or manager as soon as reasonably possible and should include all near miss or no harm incidents that could have resulted in such a loss. It should be noted that the regulations do not require a separate reporting form for workplace violence incidents. Employers may use their existing incident reporting forms as long as the form can adequately document workplace violence incidents. Reporting of workplace violence incidents is essential as it allows the investigation into the cause of the incident which will aid in your employer developing strategies for preventing reoccurrences. Documentation, Investigation, and Preventative Actions Like any other incidents that happen at the workplace, workplace violence incidents need to be promptly documented and investigated. The regulations further emphasize this by stating, an employer must ensure that incidents of violence in a workplace are documented and promptly investigated to determine their causes and the actions needed to prevent reoccurrence in accordance with the procedures established. It is important for your employer to identify and develop preventative strategies when it comes to workplace strategies. It is also important that your employer communicates these. The regulation requires an employer to communicate these strategies to any employee that is affected by an incident of violence, any committee that has been established, and any safety representative selected at the workplace. Debriefing. Much of what we have discussed about the regulations has been focused on how to assess, prevent, and respond to workplace violence. Unfortunately, no matter how much your employers try to implement these strategies, workers will become affected by a violent workplace incident. When this happens, employers need to ensure both the physical and mental health of the individual is dealt with. To ensure that workers are helped after an incident of workplace violence, the regulations state, an employer must provide an employee who has been exposed to or affected by violence at the workplace with an appropriate debriefing and must advise the employee to consult a health professional of the employee's choice for treatment or counseling. As we discussed before, workers who experience workplace violence could suffer from a number of physical, psychological, or emotional effects. For this reason, employers need to ensure that workers exposed to workplace violence, both physical and emotional, receive immediate and adequate debriefing or counseling. The main objective for this debriefing or counseling should always focus on providing support for well-being to the employee and not merely to satisfy any legislative requirements. 
Employers, therefore, need to be continuously observant and mindful of the mental health of their employees after an incident of workplace violence. There are times when your employer may not have the resources or expertise to provide an employee with the adequate debriefing they may need. Therefore, your employer should consider researching available support and counseling services that may be recommended to the affected worker. This may include their doctor, a psychologist or psychiatrist, the company's employee assistance program, if one is available, a grief counselor, or any other resources your organization may offer. In addition to providing support to the worker, debriefing also has its advantages for your employer and your organization. These advantages include increased employee productivity as employees who are both physically and mentally healthy will be much more productive at their duties. Increased morale as workers feel their safety and well-being are taken seriously. Decrease in staff turnover. Workers whose mental and physical health are compromised may need extended periods of time off, meaning that remaining staff may suffer from staff burnout due to fulfilling additional duties. An increase in workplace reporting, as staff who feel that their concerns are taken seriously will be more apt to report incidents of violence they encounter. This will in turn provide your employer more opportunity to identify and prevent future workplace incidents. And a decrease in WCB rates and insurance premiums, which aids in making your employer's organization more profitable. Thank you for taking the Awareness Workplace Violence Regulations online training. Please check out the other free online courses we offer or check out the pages under the Programs tab on the Awareness website for additional resources. To gain a certificate for this online course, you can complete the quiz by clicking below.